Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I am going to be doing a tier list that outlines the electability, so I'll stress, not favorability, but electability of each Republican primary candidate. We'll go through most of the pro uh, prominent candidates, or the ones that are included on this tier list, which in my view, uh, it contains every prominent candidate there is, how they will do in the national election, and how comfortable their margin of victory will be. So I suppose we'll just go randomly here. I'll start off with Doug Burnham. Uh, on the left here, Doug Burnham was the governor of, uh, is the governor of North Dakota, and he has been fairly popular up there. Um, the things that Doug Burnham has been prioritizing uh, or making a prominent part of his campaign um, is, is the, uh, the idea of truth and the idea of loyalty. He did a, an interview with MSNBC just a few weeks ago where he outlined that his father and his parents owned a grain elevator business in a small a North Dakotan village with 300 people and that every time he would have to um, make a sale, he was selling trust and he was selling loyalty to their customers as otherwise when they're hauling large amounts of grain to other cities and could be driving for hours on end, especially back in the 1970s and 60s. He was saying that you need to take, have the utmost care and, and put the utmost quality into your work. So he's been not so much campaigning on the issues, but that of character. Uh, he did sign one of the strictest abortion bans in the nation in North Dakota. However, he said also into the, in that interview that not necessarily did he support that bill, uh, or not necessarily would he have championed that bill, but instead it was decided on by the Republican legislature and therefore he signed it as opposed to vetoing it as they could easily override his veto. He's someone who campaigns vigorously for states' rights in regards to abortion uh, and says that he would not sign any federal, leg uh, federal abortion legislation. Now, in regards to how this appeals to Republican voters, I'd actually say he's got a better chance with moderates, as if you'll notice his key topics of uh, campaign are that of truth, and he was asked whether he would do business with a man of the character that Trump uh, is seen to have. By a large portion of the base, he, would, he said no, he would not do business with Trump in regards to being his vice president or being a part of his administration in return for his support in the primary. With that said, I've got five categories here. I've got a comfortable electoral victory as well as a popular vote victory a marginal electoral victory, toss-up, unlikely victory, and a democratic landslide. I'm going to put Doug Burnham in a toss-up because I believe he has a chance at winning over some independent or third-party voters. I believe he has a somewhat humble or modest character, but at the same time, he's just he doesn't come off as a strong and relentless fighter. In that interview, he was stuttering quite a lot, and I believe he'll be seen as someone who will look as yet another establishment politician. So he could win. He could theoretically win an electoral victory, especially with his help in the uh, rural rural swing states such as Nevada and Wisconsin. With that, let's go over to another candidate. Um, I'm not going to go to Chris Christie just yet. Let's go to Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek Ramaswamy is the, he's the chief executive officer of a technology company um, by which he's chaired for, I think, about six or seven years. Uh, he's very young. He's the youngest candidate out of anyone on this stage. Ramaswamy has been campaigning much more on the issues, so he's actually outlined in great detail what he would do if he was president. He's got points of legislation that he would enact immediately. What he wants to do is particularly an education reform mandate that every citizen, when turning 18, they have to pass a citizenship test, test to gain the right to vote. He has been trying to sort of navigate around the character issues in regards to the uh, identity politics of Trump and uh, Chris Christie and such. He's mainly campaigning uh, on a straightforward, here's what we'll do campaign, which I think can appeal to a lot of voters, especially I think with establishment uh, voters, they would be favorable to someone who's actually going to tell them what they would do uh, rather than just have a rhetoric in their view. With that said, Ramaswamy he is very young, which would contrast heavily in Joe, uh, to Joe Biden, which would work well in his favor. But he's been very anti-interventionist in regards to the war in Ukraine, which might reflect badly for a moderate or independent voter going for them. 
I, I realistically, I think it would be a marginal electoral victory, something like 272266. But for now, I'm going to put him in the toss up. The next one I want to talk about is Asa Hutchinson, the former governor of Arkansas. He's just left office and he has a pretty extensive political career dating back to the 1980s. Uh, he was a special prosecutor for Arkansas. Um, I would think that Asa Hutchinson, he is old, which will play negatively in regards to people who want a young, inspiring candidate. He did attack Trump pretty vigorously in, in the 20, after the events of 2020. Uh, he stated that Adam Schiff should not have been censured and, was, and fought heavily against that. So in regards to that, I'm going to put him in an unlikely victory. I'm not going to say landslide because I don't think... Uh, I think there will be a portion of Trump's demographic, which is currently 50% of the entire Republican Party, that will rebel against anyone that tries to attack him, of course. Uh, and this is, under the, this is all done under the pretense that these candidates aren't met with a Trump third party candidacy, uh, which could actually happen uh, if he doesn't win the nomination. With that said, I don't think that they would too vigorously attack Asa Hutchinson, but I do think they would see him as a establishment, anti-Trump, never-Trumper candidate. But instead of voting for Biden, they might vote for the Libertarian Party uh, or for another third party candidate from this field. Realistically speaking, it would probably be a Democratic landslide because of the vote split and also because of Biden-Trump voters who would vote for Biden out of protest um, and as punishment for the Republican Party for not nominating Trump. I think that could happen with a lot of these people, especially one candidate in particular that I'll talk about in a moment. But in regards to Asa Hutchinson, I don't think it would be so prominent uh, considering the old dog voters um, and old conservative voters who would turn out uh, well for someone like him. I think it would be an unlikely victory. In fact, I think it would be a comfortable victory for the Democrats, but not so much as that I would call it a landslide. Next, I want to talk about Larry Elder. Larry Elder is not a politician. He is a commentator and a journalist. Uh, he's been in the game for quite a while. Uh, he's been he was an early supporter of Trump in his 2016 campaign. He's called himself a small L libertarian as opposed to the, uh, as a member of their party. And he's also been probably, I'd, I'd argue that he's the most or one of the most conservative people uh, in this field. You might call him a neoconservative or a paleoconservative in contrast, so in comparison to some of these other guys. Um, he would be the first minority candidate that the Republicans would host, which would help uh, in districts such as Georgia, whereby the growing, uh, where there, by there is a growing diverse population. His far conservative views um, would probably do him no good with independent or moderate voters. He said that every abortion is murder. He opposes any minimum wage. He has said outright that he does what he wants the minimum wage to be abolished and the ideal minimum wage is zero dollars, I think that would probably result in the complete abandonment of independent voters, which is exactly what the Republican Party needs to win uh, this election. Um, I would say that Larry Elder would be an unlikely victory, probably less so than Asa Hutchinson, because um, he's, no, he's been you know, a supporter of Trump, and supporters of Trump would likely still support him. Um, yeah, I would say that he would lose. I think... He could probably have a chance if he were to um, moderate his views slightly more or appeal to uh, establishment candidates or independent voters. But otherwise, I don't think he actually has a base in any foreseeable demographic uh, other than that of, you know, Trump's lobby, which would still advocate for more anti-establishment uh, tendencies. So I think he would lose, probably not by the margin that Asa Hutchinson would, but still, that would be a foreseeable victory for the Democrats. Now, the next one, person I want to talk about is Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, former South Carolina governor and also ambassador to the United Nations, used to be considered a moderate, now is considered a conservative, but a very uh, anti-Trump conservative. So you might call her an establishment candidate, such to the extent of Asa Hutchinson. However, she did support Trump throughout his tenure and, he, and, and his administration. He was the very person who um, advocated and nominated her to be, uh, to be 
ambassador to the United Nations. She's also a minority. Um, I think that probably we'd see, again, another toss-up. She would be the last person that I would say would be a toss-up. Um, as a result of her shifting political views, she hasn't vigorously attacked Trump to the extent of others, but she would, I think, probably still lose out a, lot, a bit of his camp because of things she said in the past. Uh, and you know what? No, I'm going to call her an unlikely victory. Uh, I would say that she would have a, uh, a not a great chance of winning. The next candidate I want to talk about is Will Hurd. Now, Will Hurd uh, is actually not someone I'd really put on this list. He's not very prominent at all. Uh, with that said, he was the representative for a district in Texas for, I think, only one or two terms. He actually lost uh, or is no longer in that position as of this year. Will Hurd has been very moderate. You might even call him left-wing in regards to LGBTQ plus issues. He supported Pride Month and he defended... Uh, gay and log ca cabin Republicans um, during uh, June of uh, this year. For that reason, he I would I would argue that he's also going to be very critical of Trump, and I would say that if he would have been nominated, it would be a Democratic landslide because the entire Trump camp would abandon him. He would I I doubt that he would be able to moderate or or make his views more appealing to his um to Trump's camp without completely flip-flopping on uh, independent and moderate voters. Therefore, I think it'll be a very comfortable victory for whoever the Democratic candidate is. Next, I want to talk about Mike Pence, the former governor of Indiana and the former vice president of the United States. Now, yesterday, or I actually think I did the day before, he was widely seen to have made a campaign gaffe uh, when he was at a forum with Tucker Carlson and a number of other uh, Republican candidates. And he said that the failure of the Biden administration was that it wasn't giving enough money to Ukraine and that it had failed to provide military assistance to Ukraine. And as a result, they were losing. If you can't tell already, it would be a democratic landslide. Mike Pence used to encapsulate the exact, I won't say the exact, the epitome uh, of a fairly establishment, but also relatable Republican politician. If you look back in the debates in 2016 and even 2020, he was able to resonate with the voter and he was saying uh, that he understood people's, you know, fears and that he was going to be able to comfort them. And yeah, he was talking about, you know, bipartisanship and he agreed with Tim Kaine on community policing and as such. But now, after his, what Trump's camp sees as, tre as treason and as a refusal to comply with the uh, what they see as Trump's victory, I would say that they would completely turn on Mike Pence and vote for any other candidate that they could if he's the nominee. No, despite the fact that Mike Pence is actually fairly conservative. He's more conservative than some of these other guys, especially, you might even say, Trump. Mike Pence has called for enforcing uh, federal abortion restrictions, uh, which, you know, Doug Burnham would call a infringement an infringement of states' rights. But still, Mike Pence is seen as a traitor, and he would not win at all. In fact, I think he, you might you might see every single swing state, if not more, go to the Democrats based on how much 50% of the Republican Party hates him. Maybe it won't be so bad, but still, he, there's no way he wins. It would be it would be outrageous. <laughs> uh, also, on that note, Chris Christie would be a Democratic landslide, not to the extent of Mike Pence, but it's for, it's easy just to get him out of the way. Uh, as Chris Christie res represents establishment uh, Republican voters, he has been called the epitome of rhino, uh, where, which by is someone who uh, moderates their conservative viewpoints to adhere to a an independent uh, view, which is seen as negative by a lot of the Republic Republican camp, especially Trump's camp. On that note, Trump would also be a toss-up candidate. Uh, as you saw in my 2024 election video, I said that Trump would not win, uh, but I said it was still too early to tell and that economic ties, economic sorry, conditions are still uh, representing themselves. So as such, Trump could win. He would obviously have the Trump camp. 50% of the Republican Party would go for him. But keep in mind, there are also never Trumpers in the camp of the Republican Party who would support any of these guys who wouldn't support him. Now, with the existence of no labels, as I discussed in my no labels video, it's a different story. But Trump would be a toss-up victory. Then we have Tim Scott 
Francis Suarez and Ron DeSantis. Where am I going to put these guys? I'll start off with Ron DeSantis. You remember I talked in depth about, uh, you know, what was going to happen to him and how he was going to be the next president of the United States. And for a while there, he was beating Trump in the polls and now his campaign has collapsed. I would argue that he's a marginal electoral victory. I think his refusal to attack Trump vigorously, he hasn't attacked him vigorously, other than the fact that he's a fake conservative, would do well to both establishment, independent voters, and, not, and anti-establishment voters. He will do well for the anti-Trump camp. He's got a large portion of the Republican Party behind him. With that said, though, he'd need to, he'd need to boost his campaign skills, because right now he's not doing too well. So, I don't think Trump's camp would rebel against him to the same degree that they did with some of these other guys, with Will Hurd, Chris Christie, and Mike Pence. I think they would stick with him under the pretense that DeSantis would support the majority of what Trump did. I think maybe you might see half or maybe a quarter of Trump's camp not going to him. But even then, the votes that DeSantis wins over from independent voters and from anti-Trump voters would would mean he does well. And I think that he would be able to balance out where he wouldn't win the popular vote, but he would get a marginal electoral victory. Uh, the fact that he comes from Florida would mean he does well in Georgia. He appeals to Arizona suburban voters. Uh, in Wisconsin, I think he'd do well there too. And I think he could win with a very marginal, again, 272, 266 victory. But it would be close. You could even call him a toss-up as a result of the rebellion. But if Trump doesn't run a third party, I would say that they, most of Trump's camp and most of these other guys' camp would go to DeSantis. Then, final two candidates, Francis Suarez and Tim Scott. Two very interesting people. I'm going to start off with Francis Suarez here, and I'm going to put him in yet another marginal electoral victory if he's the nominee. For the sole reason... Well, actually, not for the sole reason. He's got a few things that every Republican can get behind. One, he is a minority. He is a Latin American, which would mean that a large group of that demographic would likely um, appeal to that and support him. Uh, he is from Florida. Again, that means he'll do well in Georgia. He is a mayor, which means that he supports municipal or even small government uh, exercises. His successes, you could argue his undeniable successes in regards to Miami poverty and Miami crime have made him extremely popular. He's very young. He's very charismatic. He puts a lot of effort into trying to win over the suburban white woman. And in fact, I would actually, I could be confident in saying that he could win the popular vote and with a comfortable electoral victory but I do believe that he just doesn't have the namesake for the moment I don't believe that enough people know who Francis Suarez is but he has been very smart with his campaign he's refused to attack Trump or really for that matter any candidate and instead run a positive campaign based off of his successes in Miami it's been competent he's been confident and frankly I think he's the fight to make a very fierce Republican candidate that could win. With that said, though, Tim Scott would be a comfortable popular vote and electoral victory. Tim Scott, I think, represents the future of what the Republican Party needs if it's going to survive throughout the 2020s and the 2030s. He is a minority, of course. He's an African-American man. He's from South Carolina, which means the South, which means Georgia and North Carolina. He does well in both of those states. His position as a minority would see that the Republican Party is, is edging through in a new direction. Uh, he has not attacked Trump vigorously. He has attracted, he's attacked him slightly, but he still holds fairly conservative viewpoints. He supports states' rights, though. He's, I think, centrist enough in regards to some positions and sensible enough for moderate and establishment voters to go for him and he hasn't made any enemies in regards to this stage. Trump has also gone on record of supporting him uh, in the past in regards to opportunity centers, uh, in regards to um, prison reform he did throughout the 20 uh, throughout he mentioned throughout his 2020 campaign he worked with Tim Scott on that but Tim Scott actually advised Trump in regards to how he could have handled the Black Lives Matter event uh, better and criticized him uh, after that but he does win in landslides as a senator from South Carolina he's incredibly popular he's not too young but not too old at the same time he's experienced uh, and he's also um, fairly charismatic. If you if you you know see the events he does, I think he would be able to appeal to that crowd. And I genuinely think that if he were the candidate, he would win with a very comfortable victory, both in the popular vote and the electoral vote.
And with that, that's been this video. So thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you'd like me, if you'd like to see me do more tier lists in the future, I'd be happy to. Just let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to do. Perhaps if I were to do one for the Democratic candidates, or in regards to which of these candidates has the best shot of winning the primary, that would be another one that I'd be happy to do. But thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you, and bye.